Thank you all for coming. It's very nice to be here again. Today I want to talk about Elisha, and it's titled A Double Portion. Now, this is a beautiful story in the Bible, and it has many, many lessons for our time. And I don't want to say it's a typology, let's call it a parallel, and see whether we can find something for our time in this story. Because the Bible is so rich and so deep. And in every story in the Bible, there's something for us and for our time, because the Bible was written for all times, but especially for those who live in the last days. Especially because we have the witness of all those ages right there. When Elijah went and he called Elisha, Elisha didn't say, excuse me, I still first have to do that and first have to do the other. But he was willing to follow. He's left his plow, he sacrificed his oxen. In other words, he gave up his regular trade and he went. Do you remember the time when Jesus said to the rich young ruler, sell everything that you have and follow me? What did the rich young ruler do? He went away sad. And you know what? He lost out on a great experience. He lost out on a magnificent experience. Because to walk with God and to work in His service is the richest reward that anyone could ever hope for. Amen. Not easy. Not a rose-covered path. But what a blessing. And what was Elisha called for? Humble duties. He poured the water onto the hands of Elijah. He did the menial tasks. And every one of us at some stage is going to be called and some reject it because they think they have to do some great work. But if you are prepared to start with the little things, then God will multiply it in your hands. In my own life, I had the great privilege of being called to duty also with someone like Elijah. And you know him, Pastor Francois Duplessis. And that's how I started. One silly little lecture, all scribbled onto overhead transparencies. That's all I had. But we started with that. And for those first years, I worked with him, and he did evangelism. And one experience after the other was added. Magnificent experiences. Unbelievable experiences. We just spent hours and hours recording some of those experiences, so I'm not going to talk about them now. But if you're not prepared to say, here am I, send me, then how can you expect an experience? You cannot expect it. And Elisha was being prepared for something phenomenal. Now I believe Elisha serves as a type for the very last people that will bear the vessels of the Lord on this planet. Elijah had the message, the Elijah message, the confrontation at Carmel, the great miracles that he did. He had a message for his time, and this message was to be repeated. And in the time of John the Baptist, there was another Elijah, John the Baptist himself. And he prepared the way for the coming of the Lord. And Elijah had a confrontation with a woman called Jezebel. And he despaired. He despaired at all the trials and troubles that he had. He lay in a cave and said, it is enough. But the Lord didn't take him at his word. He didn't leave him there. He picked him up and he sent him on a mission to anoint certain kings that were to be the rod of the Lord in his hand. And then he translated him. 
And the one who stayed behind was Elisha, who had poured the water on his hands. Now Elijah had been active in the schools of the prophets. And thank God there were still schools of the prophets. We can liken them to our institutes where the truth is still preached. And there were institutes at Jericho and at Gilgal and at Bethel. And there young people were being trained, as we have it today. But it was a time of tremendous crisis, tremendous apostasy. And Elijah had prophesied what would happen to Jezebel. But he never saw it happen himself while he was on earth. He could have seen it from heaven because he was translated. And then we read the story of how this message is transferred from one to the other. And we're going to go through quite a few chapters of Kings today. And we're going to try and see whether we can see some parallels which can help us in this fascinating journey. 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what shall I do for thee before I be taken away from thee? And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Just imagine that request. A double portion of the spirit of Elijah. Three times Elijah had said to him, I'm going here or I'm going there, and you stay behind. And three times Elisha had said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. Now that must be our message as well. That is what must be in our heart. There must be nothing that can induce us to separate from the Elijah message. Nothing. That's our message. I will not leave thee as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth. I will not leave thee. There will be thousands of inducements to separate us from the Elijah message. There will be evangelicals and evangelical messages that will tell us there's an easier road. Come, I'll show you a better spirituality. I'll show you another way. I will not leave thee. Because that is our message. And we may not leave it. And he has the goal to say to the greatest prophet of the time, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. That's incredible. Even Elijah was taken aback. He says, I can't promise you that. But I'll tell you something. If you see me being taken away, then it will happen. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes and he rent them in two pieces. So he rips off his cloak. He's going to do a special work. He's going to do a work that Elijah did, but with a double portion. No room for your own clothes there. Take them off. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Here was a man who'd had a call. He said, here am I, sent me. Started off humbly, did the work, the menial tasks, and now he was fitted and squared at the feet of Elijah to do a great work. We must do the same thing. We must have the same spirit. We must enthuse young people to take up this message and to stick with this message, not to leave it, not to forsake it, because there's no other work of so great import as this. 
Elijah saw the coming destruction of Jezebel in the future. He predicted it. But Elisha gave the command and it happened. So he is the type, the parallel of those who will be living in the very time when everything that the Bible has predicted about the great conflict between good and evil will come to pass. And if it weren't for the Elijah message, which was now as a cloak wrapped around Elisha, the world, its probation would have ended and no one could be saved. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. He immediately associated himself with the schools of the prophets. He didn't isolate himself. He worked with God's people. And in the same way, we must work with God's people. Are they perfect? Anything but. Are they going to make mistakes? Yes, they're going to make mistakes. Are there going to be apostates amongst them? Yes. Did Moses leave his people when apostasy broke out in the ranks? No. And neither does Elisha. He sticks to the ranks. He doesn't go and sit on some holy hill and declares himself holy flesh. He labors amongst the people, he works with them, and he identifies with them. But he's going to meet challenges and he's going to meet crises. And the way in which he deals with this tells us something about how God works through the Elijah message in the final end time Elisha. Circumstances aren't always perfect, but in spite of the circumstances, it's the message that keeps people alive. It's the message that gives hope. It's the message that heals. Now, somebody did the trouble to make accounts of all the miracles of Elijah, and they came up with a number of 14. And they did the same counts on the miracles of Elisha, and it comes to 28. Whether the details are absolutely correct is neither here nor there. The fact of the matter is, Elisha had a double portion. Not because he was greater than Elijah, but because his impact was going to be greater. His work had a universal, if he stands for the end time, Elijah message has a universal impact and has a great work to do. Now, we're going to look at some of these miracles because nothing in the Bible is arbitrary. The Bible tells us itself that these things were written for our admonition. Doesn't it say that? So that we may learn and study out of these. Maybe we will take the metaphors too far. Who knows? But let us not give up and just read a dead story of a miracle here and a miracle there. Let's apply it to the time in which we are living. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 19, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant. Where are they? In a city. It's nice in the city. As my Lord seeth, but... Whew, the water is not, and the ground is barren. What's the state of our cities? It's pleasant in the cities. You want some food? You go to the supermarket. You want some vegan food? No problem. Vegan cheese? No problem. Just go and take it off a shelf. Everything is pleasant. But the water of life, it's barren. It's dry. And the ground is barren. There's nothing coming forth. And he said, bring me a new cruise. And put salt therein. And they brought it to him. 
Now we mustn't think of the person, we think of the message. The task that rests on us today. Not before, because we are greater than others, but because God in His grace brought us into contact with this message. Bring me a new cruise. Didn't Jesus say that you cannot pour new wine into old wineskins? You cannot. Bring me a new cruise. And he put salt therein, and they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, plural. And he cast the salt therein and said, Thus said the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death or barren land. And so the waters were healed unto this day, according to the saying of Elisha, which he spoke. The Bible says we are the what of the earth? Salt of the earth. And if we are not going to do this work, if we're not going to be salt of the earth, then the cities will die. And the people will die. And the message will fade. And God will be left without witness. The end time Elisha, with the Elijah message, stands between death and life. It is the most solemn message ever given to man. There is no other message of greater importance. Now, is Elijah or the Elijah message ever going to be popular? No. Those that deliver it Will they seem grand in their great cathedrals? No. They'll be bold and pathetic. <laughs> and he went from thence unto Bet El, house of God. And as he was going up by the way, there came forth little children out of the city, and they mocked him. The Elisha message will often be mocked. It will be ridiculed. The great scientific minds of the world will turn their attention upon it and ridicule it. And as we saw with Peter, he was willing to take up the sword and fight for the Lord. But when it came to ridicule, he capitulated, didn't he? Can we stand against the ridicule? Can we stand against the affront? Well, the Lord, in his wisdom, sent forth two she-bears, and they tore asunder 42 of the children. I don't want to speculate on the number 42, but it's an interesting number. It does occur in the Bible. But the fact of the matter is when he, his authority had been established, don't forget that God is behind the message. And who is going to establish the authority of the Elijah message? God is going to do it. God is going to do it. And from there he went to Mount Carmel. So the Elisha message, just like Elijah, is identified with Carmel. And Carmel is the decision. Choose thee this day whom you will serve. Choose. If you want to follow Baal, then do it. But if you don't follow Baal, then stand on the side of the Lord. Of course, all the people cheered and said, yes, we'll follow the Lord. Did they? No. The Bible said, and they answered him, not a word. I think it is, has been our experience so far that if you confront people, with whatever the issue is in the church that is contrary to the spirit of God, either in the Bible or in the spirit of prophecy, the people tend to answer you, not a word. They just stare at you. So Carmel is an experience of the end time message. 
Now we have an interesting chapter, chapter 3 of 2 Kings, where Jehoram, the son of Ahab, begins to reign in Samaria. And he has a little bit of strife with some of his vassal states, and uh, he has a problem. And so he goes down to the king of Judah. And the king, Jehoram, went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. Already you see his character. Did someone else try to number everything? And it wasn't actually from God, it was from the devil. Because what was he trying to do? He was to, trying to determine his strength. Am I strong enough to do this? But the Bible says, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, The king of Moab has rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And Judah's king said, What have I got to do with you, Israel? You're apostate. I'm not going to work with you. Our leaders and our people are always very aware as who is exactly on the Lord's side and who is not, right? Amen. I don't think so. I don't think so. They don't always know. And so Jehoshaphat says, I will go with you. If you go, I'll be right by your side. I'm with you 100%. And off he goes, my horses will be with you, my chariots, my people are as your people. We love it when somebody comes to say, will you help me? We don't even look at the circumstances. And so the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom. Doesn't the Bible say, Jacob I love, but Esau I hate it? This is a strange alliance. And they're going to teach Moab a lesson. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand. Why? Because there was no water. What does that mean? Spiritual drought. If we have alliances with groups that are not in harmony with God's word and God's truth, then there is spiritual drought. We have to be separate. That doesn't mean we don't associate. We'll see that Elisha does associate. It doesn't mean that we don't interact, but we don't have alliances. It's a very clear message in the Bible. Come out and be separate and you will be my people, and I will be your God. Doesn't God say that? Thank God there's still an Elijah message given by an Elisha who has a double portion. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat, this is the beauty of it, He's in a wrong alliance. Does God just leave him to his purposes? This is still God's people. This is God's people. Is there no prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord for him? And one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Yes, there's Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. <laughs> What's he saying? He's making him just a little bit small, doesn't he? He says, you know, that servant of Elijah, uh, that one, he's still around. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. Now listen to Elisha's message. Elisha didn't say, I'm not prepared to help. I distance myself from you because you are all in a false alliance. He didn't do that. But his words are strong. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I to do with thee? Get thee to thy prophets of thy father and the prophets of thy mother. 
referring to Jezebel. Huh. Now let's just grab Jezebel a little bit. Where do we find her in Revelation? In which church? In the middle church, right? So here's an alliance with someone who sits at the table of Jezebel. Why don't you go to those prophets? And the king of Israel said unto him, Nay, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, surely, were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look towards thee nor see thee. That's pretty strong, isn't it? He doesn't bow down to the others and obsequiously accepts whatever they say, no matter their rank. This is a king that he's talking to. The Elisha message, as given by Elisha, can cut through to the marrow. It can call a spade a spade. But it is never left without mercy. Because we are not in heaven yet, in case you haven't noticed. We're still this side of heaven. And we're going to have turmoil. And we're going to have trouble. And we're going to face serious issues, even within the church. False alliances. Do we have them? Yes or no? We have to face up to them. Do we say in the presence of those that have the false alliances, oh, oh, I'm terribly sorry, I do not want to offend, how can I help you? No, the Elisha message cuts to the chase and says, you know what you're doing is wrong, you shouldn't be in this, in this, but because I know that you are doing this out of whatever silliness, by mercy, God will still work. But it's interesting how God works. And he says thus, says the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. I'll supply your needs. I'll help you, even in a wrong situation. I'll help you, but don't expect rain. It, the, the water will come from Moab, uh, from Edom. It'll come from over there. It's still a miracle. God takes care of his people even when they have wrong alliances. And then the waters came from Edom, and this miracle was performed. And the Moabites, the next morning, they looked, and they saw the shimmering sun on it, and it looked like blood. And they said, they fought against each other, these kings. Come, let's take them. And up they went to attack. And they ran right into the trap and were destroyed. So God, in his mercy, even helps in wrong situations. Even helps in wrong situations. And we must not forget that we are not to distance ourselves from God's people. And it's not talking to persons now. We're talking about a message. This is a message that is integral to us. So the next miracle that he performed, we read in chapter 4, verse 1. And there cried a certain woman, of the wives of the sons of the prophets. Is she in the church or out of the church? She's in the church. She's in the church. And they cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditors is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondsmen. This woman is destitute. Now think typologically. She's destitute and she's in the church. And a woman is the church. These are real events, real stories. 
We're just drawing a parallel. As I said, we might be drawing it too far, but be that as it may, I believe there's a message in there for our time, because that's what the Bible tells me. The creditors are coming. Bankrupt. Do we have people in our church today that are spiritually bankrupt? When there is a banquet on the table and they are spiritually bankrupt. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid has not anything in the house save a pot of oil. I don't think it was a very big pot. And as soon as we think of oil, we think of the parable of the ten virgins. She still had a little bit of oil. She knew the truth. She knew what it was about. And he said, go and borrow the vessels abroad. Abroad. Of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels, and borrow not a few. She's got a little bit of oil. Go abroad. Go and borrow empty vessels. How many empty vessels, devoid of the Holy Spirit, are in this world today? Millions. Don't borrow a few. And take your little bowl of oil that you have and go and pour it into those empty vessels. Is that something that we should do? This is Elisha's message to her. It's a miracle in literal terms, but it has massive spiritual applications. How can I escape from my spiritual bankruptcy within the church? What is the message for us? Take the little bit of oil that you have and start spreading it around. Go and fill the other vessels. Will it run dry? It won't run dry. It will keep on pouring and it will keep on pouring because if you want to be filled, you have to be prepared to give. And God is calling all of us because we are all women in this church to go and pour the little bit of oil that we have into the empty vessels out there. Stop hovering over those that have and give to those that have nothing. That's the three angels' messages. Go and preach the everlasting gospel to them that, that need it. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. Set it aside. So if you filled one, what do you do with it? You set it aside. And you take what? Another empty one. Do you know what? Our churches are full of people that sit in pews where you have to pour the oil into them over and over and over until it runs over and over and over and they warm the pews. There's no point in that. Carry on. So she went from him. And she shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, Bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, There is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed. How long do we continue with this work? Until there's no one left to fill until probation closes. This work is the final message to a dying world. And how many hands is God calling for? Everyone. Every single one. If we've answered the call to the Elijah message and said, here am I, send me, then that means exactly that. It doesn't mean I've been called just to save myself and to sit in a church and have a pastor preach at me from morning till noon and night 
so that he can keep on filling me and keep me happy. You'll never be happy. You'll be miserable. You'll be barren. You'll be poor. You'll be destitute. You will dry up. The only way to stay alive is to pour the oil into other vessels. Now we come to another woman and another miracle of Elisha. Verse 8, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem. Now he's outside of his district. Where was a great woman? Not an ordinary woman, a great woman. And she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, he turned in thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is a holy man of God which passes by us continually. Was she in the church? Obviously not. So she must be one of the great churches out there in our parallel. And she says, you know what? There's something odd about that Seventh-day Adventist over there who keeps on passing by. You know, perhaps, perhaps we should invite him in or her in. Let's make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. The wall protection. And let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. Oh, without the candlestick you'll be in big trouble. And it shall be when he cometh us that he shall turn in thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither and he turned into the chamber and lay there. And he said to Gehazi, his servant. We're going to talk a lot about Gehazi. Gehazi is such a pain in the neck. Do we have Gehazis in our church? Oh, he's a pain in the neck. He said to Gehazi, Call the Shunammite. And when he called her, she stood before him. And he said unto him, Say now unto her, Behold, thou hast been careful for us with all this care. What is it to be done for thee? Wouldst thou be spoken for to the king? Or to the captain of the host. Isn't that wonderful? Do you make a spiritual application? Do you want me to pray for you? To the king? To the captain of the Lord's host? Who's that? Jesus. But she says to him, hmm, I dwell amongst my own people. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm a Catholic. Oh, okay. I'm Dutch Reform. I'm a Baptist. Whatever, doesn't matter. He's busy with a great woman. And he says to her, What then is to be done for her? And Gehazi answered, Verily, she has no child, and her husband is old. And he said, Call her. And when he had called her, he stood in the door. She stood in the door. Do you get the picture here? When the Elisha message calls someone, that person comes to the door. Who's the door? Jesus says, I'm the door. They're on the very entrance into the kingdom of God. Come to the door. She stands in the door. And he said about the season, according to the time of life, thou shalt embrace a son. And she said, Nay, my Lord, Thou man of God, do not lie unto thine handmaid. But the woman conceived and bare a son, and that season that Elisha had said unto her, according to the time of life. We're looking at his miracles, and we're applying his miracles to the Elisha message, which is the cloak of Elijah. And we're seeing how it should permeate the world. The woman conceived and bare a son at that season that Elijah had said unto her according to the time of life. And then disaster strikes. The child gets sick. And he runs to his father and he says, My head! My head! 
and he takes her to the mother and the child dies. And she went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God and shut the door upon him and went out. And she called unto her husband and said, Send me, I pray thee, one of the young men and one of the, the asses, that I may run to the man of God. What will finally bring the great woman to the Elisha message, Elijah message? A crisis. A crisis. A great crisis. Maybe such a crisis where they realize that the God that they serve, the Jesus that they know, is not the right one. He's a dead Jesus. Maybe a great crisis will make them come. Doesn't the spirit of prophecy in the Bible tell us that kings will come to the brightness of your dawn and that many, many will take the place of half-converted People in God's church who will be spewn out of his mouth. Doesn't it say that? And she runs. And where does she run to? She went and came unto the man of God to Mount Carmel. Every time God brings his people to the Carmel experience, choose. Who are you going to serve? Who is it going to be? And the man of God saw her far off and said to Gehazi, his servant, Behold, yonder is that Shunammite. Run now, I pray thee, to meet her. Pain in the neck, Gehazi. Go and meet her. And ask her, Is it well with your husband? And when she came to the man of God to the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi came near to thrust her away. We always have Gehazis in the church. Have you ever held public campaigns and seen the Gehazis when they come to cling to the feet of the true message of Jesus? Oh, what are you doing here? You know that thing around your neck? It's going to go. That thing hanging on your ear? It's going to go. Why are you eating this way? Why are you doing that way? What are you doing? What are you clinging here? Don't you know you are unclean? Did they say that to Jesus in his day? Didn't they accuse him that he was eating with the publicans and with the tax collectors? That he was mingling with the unclean? Oh no! What is this thing you are doing constantly evangelizing to the outside? You should be concerned with your church. You should pour the oil out until it drips onto the floor. Onto those who already have. There's always a Gehazi who will mess it up. There's a time and a place for everything. God will see to it that that which separates us from the others because their understanding isn't full will come right. If the Spirit is right, things will come right. Don't run ahead of time. Don't make decisions as to whether a person is worthy of this message or not. Jesus said to a tax collector, come follow me. And he wrote the Gospel of Matthew. So never, never let a Gehazi come between you and evangelism. And then she tells him about her plight. And then he said to Gehazi, Gird up thy loin and take my staff in thine hand and go thy way. If thou meet any man, salute him not. And if any salute thee, answer him not again and lay my staff upon the face of the child. So Elisha gives Gehazi a duty to perform. And the mother of the child said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And he arose and followed her. Did she trust the Gehazis in the church? No. The Gehazis in the church, you can't trust them with things like that. No, no, no. Where's the one who preaches the message? I want him. I want him. I don't want someone else. I want her, that one. I will not leave thee. And Gehazi runs ahead. 
and he does whatever it has to, he has to do. But nothing happens. It doesn't work. He's like the disciples who couldn't drive out the demon because of jealousy in their hearts. Nothing works. But when Elisha got there, he went and lay upon the child and he put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands and he stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm and he returned and walked into the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and opened its eyes. If we spent time with the people out there, then life will return to that son. And they can experience him. And he says to her, take up thy son. And her whole attitude was changed. This was the truth. She'd come to the point where Ruth was. Where you go, I will go. I will not leave you. I will not return to my gods. I will not leave you. Your God will be my God, and your people will be my people. So are you going to let yourself be put off by the Gehazis in the church? Or are you going to continue with the straight message that God has entrusted to his people? Irrespective of the obstacles, God will cut through the obstacles. People aren't blind. They'll separate those that really mean it from those that appear to mean it. Another miracle. Verse 38. And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was... Uh, Death in the land. Is there going to be a lot of death in our church? We're going to have death. We're going to have death. Brothers and sisters, we're not in heaven. We're this side of heaven. There's going to be death. Spiritual death. What is our condition? Can you remind me? Blind? Pitiful? Poor, wretched, naked. But never forget that there are still 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal. Because if we forget that, we will despair. Here he comes to Gilgal, and there is dearth in the land. And the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and he said unto his servant, Set on a great pot and seethe pottage for the sons of the prophets. People need food. They need spiritual food. Give them food. People are dying for lack of knowledge. Give them something to eat. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild goods, his lap full. Oof. And he came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. Do you know what? We have people who go and gather wild goods. But I cannot say to them that they are vindictive, because many of them are gathering them without knowledge. For they knew them not. They don't know what they're doing. They read something here, they read something there, and they gather a wild good, and they say, oh, look what I found, a good called spiritual formation. Let me put that into the pot and feed it to God's people. I found a great Jesuit who can preach in my church. Maybe he has a mes message for me. Maybe he can preach at one of my universities. Maybe we can give him a standing ovation. Who knows? I'll put him in the pot. <laughs> and feed him to God's people. Our people sometimes act out of ignorance. I know this is a harsh comparison, but it is a reality too. It is also a reality. But as I'm saying, I dare not judge. Is it out of vindictiveness? 
or is it out of a lack of knowledge? So let's assume they knew it not. So they poured out for the men to eat, and it came to pass, as they were eating of the potash, that they cried out and said, O man of God, there is death in the pot! There's death in the pot. Because if you mix one wild, noxious good with the others, everything becomes contaminated. How do you fight this error? How do you fight the wrong doctrines, the wrong lessons, the wrong spirit that comes into the church? How do you fight a false good in the pot that is to feed God's people? How do you do it? The Elisha way. Listen to this. This is beautiful. I'll probably be crucified for this parable, but nevertheless, let's go ahead. But he said, then bring meal. And he cast it into the pot and he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. He took wheat flour, meal, and he put it in the pot. So how did he fight error? With truth. He fought it with truth. Give them something real to eat. Fight error with truth. And there was no more death in the pot. And the very next thing that happens, there came a man from Baal Shalisha and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits. Ha! something to eat. Twenty loaves of barley and full ears of corn in the husk thereof, and he said, give unto the people that they may eat truth. And his servitor said, what should I set this before a hundred men? He said again, give the people that they may eat, for thus says the Lord, they shall eat and shall leave thereof. Elisha is foreshadowing a great miracle of Jesus Christ. Multiplying the bread in his hands. And twelve baskets were taken up thereafter. If we fight truth with truth, even if our numbers are small, even if those who cling, cling to the cloak of Elijah having ripped their own cloak, then God will multiply it in our hands and we will see great wonders. So 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 44 says, So he set it before them and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. We must fight error in the church with truth. And God has given us a great abundance of truth. And he has given us the testimonies so that no one has an excuse as to what our purpose and our message is. And we must stick to it. Now his next miracle you all know, and I'm not going to spend much time on it, just a few points. Naaman. Captain of the host of the king of Syria. You know the story. He has leprosy. But there's someone in his house, and I like the way the Bible says it. The Bible is so cute. And the Syrian had gone out by companies and had brought away captives out of the land of Israel. A little maid. Isn't that cute? A little maid. And she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him from his leprosy. If leprosy of sin clings to you, the little maid, the little one doing her normal chores here and there, can bring a message of life and hope. And so he goes to the king and he says, can I go to that prophet? 
And the king writes a letter to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel tears out his hair, saying, Am I a God that I should heal this man? We're going to have war with the Syrians. And Elisha hears it. And he says, Israel, are you bankrupt? Don't you realize there is the power of God in this place to heal from the leprosy of sin? So Elisha, the man of God, had heard, chapter 5, verse 8, that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, and he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariots, and he stood at the door. Same place. When someone comes to the Lord, he has to enter that door. He didn't come into the door, he stood at the door. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times. Now you know the story. He was furious. Here he comes with his chariots and his horses and his gifts and his pomp and his glamour. And the prophet doesn't even go and see him. Sends someone and says, go and wash in the Jordan. And he says, aren't the rivers of Syria so much better than this foul little smelling little river here? Don't the people outside think that we are miserable? I think they do. But he has a good advisor and he says, you know what, if the prophet had told you some great thing, would you not have done it? Go and wash seven times. This is the number of God. And so he goes and washes seven times. Seven, the number of God. And he's healed. And he rushes back and he's excited. And he says, yeah, I want to pay you. I want to pay you. But Elisha says, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. You know what? There will always be Gehazis in the church. We cannot get rid of the Gehazis. They're part and parcel of us. And Gehazi thought, what a terrible thing. He didn't realize that the gospel was free. You're going to charge for the gospel. So he runs after him and he tells him, give me this and give me that. And he hides it. But of course, you can't hide anything from God. And this admonition from Elisha, in verse 26, the second half. Is it a time to receive money and to receive garments and olive yards and vineyards and sheep and oxen and men servants and maid servants? Do you know there are some who think that they can peddle the gospel that are in this for personal gain? If that is our motive, then we might as well separate ourselves from the Elijah message. If our motive isn't to save souls, if we have selfish motives in a time like this, when all that we possess means nothing, because everything can be taken away in an instant. In fact, they've already decided to take it away in an instant. And they've practiced it already. They've practiced it already. Is this a time to think about our personal lives? I'm not saying go and live in a hovel. But don't make that your aim. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Go and work. The leprosy, therefore, of Naaman shall cleave unto thee. And yes, we have leprous Gehazis in our church. Everywhere we go, they will be there. Can that deter us from the message? The truth will grow no matter what. It will expand. 
Chapter 6, verse 1, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold, now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. It's too small. Can everyone take a beam? Everyone take a beam? Not just a few of us. Everyone take a beam and let us make a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he answered, I will go. And so he went with them. And when they came to Jordan and cut down wood, but as one of them was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. You know the story. Go out and do the Lord's work. Go and build his kingdom. Go and expand it. Keep on. Whether you have means or whether you don't have means, whether you work with something borrowed, whether you work with your own means, just go. The Lord will take care of it. Doesn't he do that? I've traveled all over the world. I've been in so many places. And in most cases, I've been there without a cent, without money. Nothing to sustain me. I've never had occasion to say, I'm destitute, I'm starving. Never. God has always taken care of it. And if you come into a foreign land and your wallet has nothing in it, that's quite a challenge. But I've done it on numerous occasions. And God has supplied miraculously. Go and do it. And if the axe head falls into the water... God will provide means for you to take care of it. But we must be prepared to do this way, this work. And then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants. The kings of Syria will always war against God's people. But Elisha, having the cloak of Elijah, will know the times we are living in. He will study the times. And he will study the ways and the means of the enemy because everybody who is in a war must know his enemy. Isn't that right? We must know our enemy. We must know the times we are living in. And we will be able to warn God's people. They're planning this. They're planning that. Be careful. The king of Syria is gathering his forces over there. The Elijah message in the double portion must have discernment. And eventually, the king of Syria will get angry. Therefore sent he hither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city with a shout. And you know the story. Elisha is perfectly calm. This great host has come to take him captive, to arrest him, to take him to jail, to take him to a prison dungeon. I've had occasion when that has happened to me. I've had occasions when a person has held their border guard gun up my nostril and I've had occasions when the king of Syria surrounded me but those that are with us are more than those that are with them and so Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said smite this people I pray thee with blindness and then he takes them to the king of Israel, and the king of Israel rubs his little hands in glee and says, shall I kill them? And Elisha says to him, did you take them captive? If you'd taken them captive, wouldn't you use them as slaves or something like that? No, 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 give them bread. What do you do when they come to attack you? You give them bread. Feed them with the truth. And guess what? They left and they didn't bother him anymore. This is a beautiful message, the Elisha message, with a cloak of Elijah. 
It has a far-reaching effect. All the waters will be cleansed. And then again we come to a great famine in Samaria. A terrible famine in Samaria. And then there was a siege. The Syrians were all around. Magnificent story. And a great famine. And this woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. And the king hears it. And he's horror struck. There's such famine amongst God's people that even the children are being eaten up. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him. And she has hid her son. That's a terrible message. Do you think in the course of time we can get situations where our very children are eaten up by barrenness in the church? Think it's possible? Do you think we could send our God-fearing children raised in the fear of the Lord to a college of ours where they will be fed evolution and lose their faith in God and some of our institutes could eat up our children alive. I've sat in the meeting where one person burst into tears and said that very thing. Said, I sent my children to this institute and today they are atheists. You have killed my children. You have eaten them alive. We do have such droughts in our midst. But we do have an Elijah message. And that's the only thing that can cope with this kind of drought. Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And the one who was beside the king said, Poof, I don't believe that. So Elisha said to him, maybe you don't believe it. You will see it with your eyes, but you won't eat it. You won't get that bread. And that's the sad story of our church. It's going to happen. There will be some that will see the miraculous workings of God in the face of great apostasy, and they will not be able to benefit by it because of a lack of faith. We are living in very, very serious times. And this message, you must cling to it. Because if you let it go, you will starve to death. Only the Elijah, Elijah message can cut through the siege. There is no other message that can save us from the dearth, the spiritual dearth that has entered into our midst. Then the, Lord on, then the Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, You will, not, you will see it, but you won't experience. What happened? The lepers. Lepers, those that are steeped in sin within our midst, went out of the camp because the camp had been scattered because they'd heard the voice and the noise of chariots and they'd run away, the Syrians, and left their camp with all their food and everything that was in it. And the first ones to benefit were the lepers. And they ate and they were filled. Elisha's message can cut through this siege. But if we let go of it, there is nothing that can save us from it. We may not let the Elijah message die 
in our midst. We must stand by the three angels' messages as given to our pioneers. If we let it go, we will lose everything. Our children will be eaten up. And they rose up at twilight, and they ate. And one of his servants answered and said, verse 13, chapter 7, Let some take, I pray thee, five of six horses that remain, which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel that are left in it. And off they go. There's just a small remnant left. And eventually they find the food. Only when the Syrian is smitten, out of our ranks, will we find food in abundance. Only when that is removed can we achieve that. Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof, was the word of Elisha. And that man was trampled in the gate. He was trampled in the gate. He could have had it, but he lost it all. Now let's go to another one. Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Unbelief kills. Unbelief kills. Chapter 8. Then spoke Elisha unto the woman whose son he had restored to life. Now who's he talking to again? He's talking to people outside the church. Saying, Arise and go th thou and thy household and sojourn wherever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord has called for a famine. And it shall also come upon the land seven years. How long was... Elijah's salmon, a famine. How long was it? Three and a half years. Here's a double portion. <laughs> Seven years of famine. And the woman is told, go and sojourn wherever you can sojourn. Do you know what? I've experienced this. Sometimes I'm so scared to bring people into the church because the church is not ready to receive them. There's a famine in the church. Elijah had a three and a half year famine. There's an interesting type in the three and a half years. Can one fast when the bridegroom is with you? No. So that seven year was cut in half. The first year was graced by his presence. The second, by calling a remnant out of rejection. But here, the seven years of famine, the full period, until this famine ends, we will only have drips and drabs come into our church. Because the woman will sojourn wheresoever until the famine is over. And when this famine ends, and I'm telling you brothers and sisters, this famine is soon going to end. Because the Lord is going to mightily shake this church. And then the famine will end. The famine will end. Sojourn in the land of the Philistines. That's where she went. You know, there were plenty of widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, but the Lord sent him to none of them. And the Jews were so angry with Jesus when he said it. And he said there were plenty of lepers in Israel in the days of Elisha, but only Naaman the Syrian, he was cured. And we're in the same situation. At the first coming of Jesus, there was such a spiritual dearth that they nailed him to the cross. At the second coming of Christ, there will be such a spiritual dearth that most people will nail him to the cross. But thank God, not all. 
And when the shaking comes and people are shaken out in their droves, the woman on her sojourn amongst the Philistines will take her place in the church. But if we don't sow, she won't know where to go. And the woman arose and did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines seven years. And it came to pass at the seven-year end that the woman returned out of the land of the Philistines, and she went forth to cry unto the king for her house and for her land. And the king talked with Gehazi, the servant of the man of God, saying, Tell me, I pray thee, all the great things that Elisha has done. He has a change of heart. And it came to pass as he was telling the king how he had restored the dead body to life. And behold, the woman whose son he had restored to life cried to the king for her house and for her land. And Gehazi said, My lord, O king, this is the woman, and this is her son whom Elisha restored to life. And she got everything back. In the same way, Jesus will reward her at the end of time and everything that she thought loss will be gain. And then the sad story of how this terrible event will take place. There will be a terrible shaking in our midst. Elijah's message goes to the end of time. It doesn't stop. It is the last message to a dying world. It is the only message that can bring life. But there will be a terrible time of trouble. Now, Elisha came to Damascus and Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, was sick. And Hazael comes to him and says he's sick. And Elisha looks at him and he starts weeping. And he says, you, you will be the rod that the Lord will use and you will come and smite the children of Israel and you will rip open the stomachs of their wombs and rip out their children. And he looks at him and he says, am I a dog? that I should do this thing. But he looks at him and he settles his countenance at him steadfastly until he was ashamed and the man of God wept. Why weepeth my Lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil thou wilt do unto the children of Israel. Their strongholds wilt thou set on fire. Their young men wilt thou slay with a sword and wilt dash their children and rip up their women with child. Am I a dog that I should do that? He said, go and tell your king that he will live, but actually he will die. And so he goes and tells the king and he holds a wet cloth over his face and he kills the king of Syria and he becomes king and the word of God is fulfilled. And at the same time, the rod continues. And Hazal reigned in his stead. And in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, Jehoshaphat being king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, began to reign. But he walked in the ways of the king of Israel, as did the house of Ahab. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Our church is in a state. Our church is in a state. Even Judah is married in the family of Ahab's apostasy. That the Lord would not destroy Judah for David, his servant's sake. Yes, we have bad marriage alliances. We're in deep, deep trouble. But the Lord still has his hand over this church. And then Edom revolts under the hand of Judah unto this day. There's conflagration, trouble all around. In the twelfth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, did Ahaziah, son of Jeroboam, king of Judah, begin to reign. 
Two and twenty years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Ataliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. Terrible situation in the church. Ecumenical alliances here, sitting in that council over there, listening to the word of this Jesuit, listening to the word of that whatever. And Elisha the prophet called one of the children of the prophet and said unto him, Gird up thy loin and take this box of oil in thine hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when thou comest hither, look out there, Yehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, and go and pour this oil upon him. He anoints the other rod. So two rods. He predicted. He predicted. There would be strife from without, and there will be strife from within. There will be terrible separation in this church. There will be a terrible conflagration. I have anointed thee king of the people of the Lord and over Israel. Thou shalt smite the house of Ahab, thy master, and the house of Ahab shall perish, and the dogs shall eat Jezebel. The dogs shall eat Jezebel. Who had predicted that? Elijah had predicted it. Elijah had said it would do it. I'll come to that in a moment. Then Jehu came forth to the servant of the Lord, and one said unto him, Is all well? Wherefore came this mad fellow out to thee? And he said unto them, You know the man and his communication. But he said, I was to be king. So the world might consider Elijah's message through Elisha madness. And they might say that those who preach the three angels' messages and who warn against the mark of the beast and against the beast and his image are mad. But this message will do its work. And Yehu rides on his chariot. This represents... God's prophecy of what will happen at the end of time. And there shall not one iota of the three angels' messages fail. Everything will come to fruition. Joram said, make ready, and his chariot was made ready. They were at war, he was wounded. Here comes Yehu, and he kills him. And then... He gathers the people and he destroys every single one of the sons of Ahab. All of them. And they did so at the going up of Ger, which is in Iblaim. And he fled to Megiddo and he died there, even the king of Judah, who is in all these false alliances, will die. This is happening within the church. And then Jehu came to Jezreel, and Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her face and tired her head. Ooh, she made herself beautiful, and she looked out of the window. Is there someone else who always looks out of the window and blesses the people? <laughs> but Jehu said to the eunuch, throw her down. And she's thrown down, and her blood splatters against the wall. This is a terrible thing that happens. And this happens in the time of Elisha. So the final Jezebel that will be destroyed happens in the time of Elisha, antitypically. So the double portion is for God's people at the end of time. He's a type of the remnant that will preach this message. Throw her down. And the horses trod her underfoot. Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. Every single one of them died. And when they picked up that woman because Yehu went to eat, there was only a head and the feet and the hands. Three little bundles. That's all that was left. 2 Kings chapter 10, verse 10. Know now that there shall fall unto the earth nothing 
Please note this. Of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spake concerning the house of Ahab, for the Lord has done that which he spake by his servant Elijah. So Jehu slew, slew all that remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel and all the great men and his kinfolks and his priests until he left him none remaining. God will cleanse his church. And then he called a great feast and he said, I worship Baal even more than Ahab. Bring all the Baal worshippers. Ooh, and they came with their Jesuit spirituality. And he brought them into a great temple. Wonderful things happening. Gathering all the people together and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, Yehu shall serve him much. Bring the people. Whoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Yehu did it in subtlety to the intent that he might destroy the worshippers of Baal. And then he gathers them all together. Now, look what he does. It's fascinating. In verse 23, it says, And Yehu went and Yohanadab, the son of Rechab, into the house of Baal, and said unto the worshippers of Baal, Search, and look, that there be here with you none of the servants of the Lord, but the worshippers of Baal only. Not one grain will fall to the ground when the Lord starts sifting this church. Search. Is there just one here even? of God's people. Take him out. And then they are all destroyed. And they smote them with the edge of the sword. Verse 25, second half. And the guard and the captains cast them out and went to the city, to the house of Baal. This was the prophecy that Elijah had made. But it is fulfilled in the time of Elisha. And I believe that events in the world are coming to a point when these very things will happen. And we will see, by the grace of God, the culmination of these things. And the Elisha message will cut through the dross and make it plain to the whole world that there is a God in Israel. And those women who had been wandering to and fro amongst the Philistines, will come into this church in droves. Let's quickly just run through Elijah's prophecy regarding Naboth. We read that in 1 Kings chapter 21, and it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me thy vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs. Because it is near unto my house, and I will give thee for a better vineyard than that. Give me your vineyard. What's the vineyard stand for? This is the church. This is God's people. And the antitypical Ahab will come, and he will say to this church, Come over to our side. Come. Come a Sunday-keeping church. I'll build you a mega church. I'll put 10 drums on the stage and you can make a lot of noise and fill the place up. You'll have a great church. I'll give you a better vineyard. Have we done it? Yes. And where are most of those churches? They've gone the way of Cain. They've left our midst. They are now worshipping Baal. If we don't Listen to the word of God. If we don't become like Naboth and say, as the Lord lives, you will not get this vineyard, then we will be in big trouble. But if we don't give it to him, he's going to take it. And Jezebel is going to be the one who tells him it's quite, quite in order. You can take it. And I'll get rid of this pesty little Naboth who says this and that and the other. We cannot give our vineyard to Jezebel. This is the Lord's church. This is the final message. But she will say, Naboth is stoned to death. Naboth is stoned to death. The antitypical Naboth. 
will not give his vineyard either. And the word of the Lord came unto Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth, whether he's gone down to possess it. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus says the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus says the Lord, In the place where dogs lick the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. And Ahab said to Elijah, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to the work of evil in the sight of the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and will take away thy posterity, and will cut off from the house of Ahab. And now there's a verse in the Bible that will shock some people, and some Bibles, or most of them, cover it over and give it different words so it doesn't sound so bad, because surely God can't speak like this, but he does. Behold, I will bring evil upon thee, and I will take away thy posterity, and I will cut off from Ahab him that pisses against the wall. Excuse me. And him that is shut up and left in Israel. That's quite a harsh saying. Have you ever seen a a dog mark his territory? When he lifts his leg and does whatever he has to do against the wall? That's what Jezebel did. Jezebel got her people, excuse the word, but it is in the word of God, to piss against the wall. What does the wall stand for? It stands for the law of God. And Jezebel's people and those of her ilk thumb their nose at the law of God. They urinate against it and say, this is my territory. I will declare the law. And that's what she does. But she will die. You can't piss against the Lord's wall. You'll be in great trouble. And he will make thine house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Naboth. You can't thumb your nose at God's end time message. Now brethren, here's a warning. When the Millerites had done their preaching... And they are just a tiny sample of the early reign of Adventism. We are waiting for the latter reign. It will be greater, yes. But there were 50,000 Millerites that accepted the truth. And when the shaking had come, how many were left? 50. 50. Do we want to be shaken out? Do we want our numbers reduced to nothing? Are we going to allow Jezebel and her ilk to urinate against God's wall? The pillars of Adventism must be maintained. Let that therefore abide in you which you have heard from the beginning. If that which you have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you shall continue in the Son and in the Father. 1 John 2, verse 24. Take heed to the doctrine. Take heed to the doctrine. A quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. I long daily to be able to do double duty. I've been pleading with the Lord for strength and wisdom to reproduce the writing of the witnesses who were confirmed in the faith in the early history of the message. After the passing of the time in 1844, they received the light and walked in the light. And when the men claimed to have new light would come in with their wonderful messages regarding various points of scripture, we had, through the moving of the Holy Spirit, Testimonies right to the point which cut off the influence of such messages. We must plead for a double portion to meet the crisis that is ahead of us. And when every wind of doctrine begins to blow in our midst, let the Elijah message cut through the chase. It's the only one that can save this world. 
May God bless this church. May God bless this message. And may God bless his people. And may God give them a double portion that they can stand in the time that we are living in. Amen. Amen.